Hi friends, welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany. In today's video, I am going live to talk about the top 20 fantasy books I read in 2022. Um, so we're working our way through my end of year list. I'm very excited about this one. And of course, I do have a slideshow for you. Welcome. I'm going to say hello to the comments in a moment, but just a little bit of housekeeping with the way I've been doing these live streams. For anybody who is watching this later, not on live, if you are not interested in hearing the chit chat part of the comments, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about a book, look at the comments, move to the next book. So if you want to skip over the parts where I'm doing chit chat, you're welcome to do that if you just want to hear kind of my commentary. Um, with that said, hi, everybody. How are you doing? <laughs> um, we've got some people waiting, which is exciting. Hi, Misty, typing up a review. Love it. Um, hi, Mooney Queen. Glad you can catch it. Hi, Kirsten. Hi, Seventh Chariot. Hey, Tara. Hi, Jenna. Hey, Sarah, Beth, Carrie. We've got lots of people here. This is exciting. Um, so yeah, I'm excited about this. Fantasy, you know, nobody's shocked is my most read genre. <laughs> um, that and romance. And so my top 20 is out of the 123 fantasy books that I read in 2022. Sneak peek at, you know, my still to come reading stats video, which will be fun. But I read 123 fantasy books in 2022. These were my top 20. And even doing that was tricky, but I think I did a pretty good job. So hi, cozy reader Kelly. Glad you made the video. Hey, Pat. Hi, Cappuccino Crafts. I see people are kind of coming on in. So let me go ahead and pull up the slideshow. <clears throat> All right. So we're going to count down to my favorite fantasy books. Um, Beth says, I so want to be you when I grow up. <laughs> Just read all the fantasy. Fair enough. Hi, Evie. All right. Um, but of course, as as has been the case in all the, the end of year content I've been doing, um, you know, in support of the HarperCollins Union, which is still on strike. Um, there are two HarperCollins titles on this list that I can't talk about until after the strike has ended. Ship of Magic and The Mad Ship by Robin Hobb. I was just glad there weren't more. But um, yeah, go follow the HarperCollins Union, sign their petition, donate to the strike fund. It is absurd. We're, you know, 51 days into the strike and still there's no word from HarperCollins management. Like, yeah, so. One day, HarperCollins will get it together. I certainly hope so. That would be great. HarperCollins management needs to get their chits together. Yes, this is ridiculous. I agree. It is absolutely ridiculous. Thank you, Day 51. Um, it is absolutely wild that we are still here. So, yeah. And it is interesting because I know behind the scenes, there are also now authors being like, I don't know if I would want to sell my book to HarperCollins because if this is how they treat people. So I'm just saying. Harper Collins does need to clean up their act. Agreed. With that said, we're going to count down my top 18 fantasy books that I read in 2022, beginning with number 18. This is a YA fantasy. I do have a few YA titles on this, and I'll let you know which ones are YA, which ones are adult. I think I actually also have a couple middle grade titles, which don't always make my favorites list, but there were a couple good ones this year. Um, but The Bone Spindle by Leslie Vetter was just a rollicking good time. This is a gender flipped Sleeping Beauty meets Indiana Jones book. It's delightful. It's got this female friendship that is centered to it. These two girls on the cover have this great friendship. One of them has a sapphic love interest. The other one has a, a love interest who's a prince who's been put to sleep. And it was a blast. This was so much fun to read. I am very excited for book two, which is coming out pretty soon. So highly recommend if you haven't checked this out. It's great. <laughs> so yeah. Um, Beth, I still need to get to this one. It sounds so good. And the sequel is out. It's not out yet. It is out, I want to say February, but pretty soon. I think in February, the sequel is coming out. I do plan to read it. I hope 
they oh yeah the owner is an old white man <laughs> the harper collins yeah carrie says well i'm sold yes um did the sequel come out last year does it come out this year i think i answered this yeah the sequel to this is coming out this year in february i still want to read this one but read too many sleeping beauty retellings last year fair enough i will say this is probably my favorite of the Sleeping Beauty retellings I read because it's not really, I mean, it, it is a Sleeping Beauty retelling, but it takes it in a different direction. And it's got Indiana Jones kind of adventure fun mixed in. So it's a very good time. Hello, Night Owl reader. Welcome. Yes, we are talking fantasy. <laughs> um, fantasy is probably, I would say, my favorite genre. So yeah more than malice or different very different oh yeah i do love malice that's a good point i didn't read malice last year i read it, i think i read it the year before um but very different vibes malice is i would say angstier and more focused on a central sapphic romance whereas this is like fun action adventure with some side romances and a central friendship so it's it's quite different but malice is a good one too all right number 17 is the trouble with peace by joe abercrombie if you don't know me and leanna at leanna's library did a read-along of the entire first law canon in 2022 which was a really good time we did it for chapter three podcast which is a podcast that we co-host me and leanna do the sci-fi fantasy episodes together and then me and izzy from happy for now do romance episodes together so um also we're doing a witcher read-along this year tune in for that if you're interested i'm really excited but i love joe abercrombie and i had not gone past the original trilogy until this past year and had such a good time with it. So you're going to see two Abercrombie titles on this best of list. I think he's so good. There are not a lot of men writing fantasy who I really trust to write great female characters and handle them appropriately. And I don't know, just like treat them like people <laughs> instead of archetypes or stereotypes. And um, I think this is great. Joe Abercrombie is a very character driven fantasy author. And so this is, it technically falls into grimdark. And by that, I mean that it. It's subverting a lot of common fantasy tropes, so you don't necessarily have a hero's journey, and like all the characters are morally gray to bad, <laughs> but there, and there's a lot of like dark gallows humor, um, but I love them. I think his character work is some of the best. Not a plot-driven series, really amazing. Trouble with Peace was among my favorites this year, so definitely recommend the series if you haven't checked it out. All right, let's look at the comments. Yes, Joe Abercrombie, Night Owl Reader, finished The Blade itself a few days ago and it was so fun. Yeah, good. It's good. Yeah, we have episodes and we have podcast episodes for every book. So that was fun. Yes, The Trouble with Peace. Okay, probably your favorite from the series. Nice. This was my second favorite, but I, I think there's an argument to be made. Hello, Vixen of Fiction. Beth says, love book one of the series and need to keep going. I would recommend. I'm glad people are excited to see the fantasy list. Uh, just ordered a taste of Golden Iron because of my romance list. Yay. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah, if you missed it yesterday, I did my um, top 17 romances from 2022. Why do I not have a consistent number on my list? Because I'm making the list and I can make the rules. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm doing it how I want to do it. Um, very true about men writing women. Yeah, not everybody does it well. Joe Abercrombie, I think, does a really good job. Hey, watching on double speed so you can catch up. All right, love it. Uh, yes, Savine is your morally dubious fave. Same. Listen, Savine, Savine is, I think, possibly my favorite character in the series. I like, I vibe with her so much. She's amazing. Hi, Tangible Reads. Some new books to think about. Love fantasy. Well, great. Hi, Disa. Oh, much love from Reykjavik, Iceland. I don't know if I said that right. I hope I did. Hi. Um, now I'm like, I need the second book. Yes. Yeah. Keep going. The, the, 
the final book is uh, some, really something. So I am a fan of the series. Number 16 was a surprise for me. This is a middle grade fantasy, Shinji Takahashi and the Mark of the Quaddle by Julia, Julie Kagawa. This was sent to me in a PR package from Disney Books. They sometimes send me stuff. And I was like, oh, this looks cute. I'll hold on to it for my kids and um, read it to them before bed. And it was so much fun. I think at least for, they liked it. They liked it a lot too. But I think for me, it was one of my most fun reading experiences of, of of like reading a novel to them before bed. And I really liked what this book was doing. It is middle grade action adventure and it's playing with like mythology. It's also got some of those kind of Indiana Jones vibes to it. But one thing that I love about this is that it does that while also using it as an opportunity to talk about things like colonization and cultural appropriation and like taking cultural objects from the places where they belong and the harm that that does, which I think is amazing. And it's done in an age appropriate way. So I just thought this was fantastic and a whole lot of fun. I loved it. I am very excited for the second book in the series, which is coming out later this year. So if you are on the lookout for a good middle grade fantasy with lots of action and adventure, I would recommend this one. Julie Kagawa is amazing. I read the first Shadow of the Fox book and I liked it pretty well. It wasn't like my... It had some tropes that are not my personal favorite, but I did like it. This I really, really loved though. Kelly, you really want to read this? Love middle grade fantasy and that one looked great, especially to read with your daughter. Yeah, I think this is a great one to read aloud to kids. I read my kids for for reference are six and eight and a half. And there were a couple scenes that were a little scary for the six-year-old, but overall I think it, it went pretty well. Shinji Takahashi, that name makes me think the protagonist is from Japan. Yes. Uh, yes, the protagonist is a kid whose parent is a Japanese American, basically. Julie Kagawa, I like her books. Haven't read her Fey books yet. Yeah, a lot of people like her books. I think this is great. Yay, I'm glad people are excited to try this. Oh, thank you for joining the membership, Disa. Welcome. Shadia loved the Shadow of the Fox trilogy. Great. I really want to read this one, though, by Julie. Yeah, I, I think this is a really good one. And um, again, there's a second book in the series coming. Kelly, I have an eight-year-old that loves mythology of all kinds. This seems perfect. Yes, definitely check it out. And I think it's it does a good job, too, of setting it up for an entire series, which, which is cool. All right. <clears throat> Moving on to number 15. This is The Ninth Rain by Jen Williams. This was so good. I read this because well, I had heard about it from a bunch of people. There were a lot of booktubers who really loved the series. Elliot Brooks is one. There are others. And so it had been on my radar. The books went out of print in the UK and were hard to get your hands on, but you could get the audiobooks. And now I think starting this month, they are getting published in the US because there's been demand for them, which is cool. So it's a trilogy. I just read the first one so far, but I do want to continue. And my patrons, some of my patrons voted on this as a book they wanted to see me vlog. So I have a vlog <laughs> um, for this one that I read around the holidays. It's really cool. It's a genre blend, which I am a fan of. It's kind of like a sci fantasy with horror elements. And the world is very interesting. Um, I, I just had such a good time reading it. I think if I'm being objective about it, the character work is good, but not amazing. But I was just so caught up in the world and the plot and everything that was happening and the political twists and turns and stuff that um, I didn't mind. So if you're on the lookout for something fun that's a little bit more fast paced, I think this is a, a great one to check out. So yeah, recommend. Tisa did purchase this one. I don't know if this is the ninth rain, but maybe. Carrie has heard so much about this book. Yeah, a lot of a lot of booktubers have liked it. Yes, Tara, read it. It's uh, it's a good one. This was one of Shadia's favorites from last year. Awesome. Night Owl Reader says, I have a student that loves a certain fantasy series I'll not name, and I'm looking for other fantasies like that one. Okay. Um been reading that series over and over. Um, I think Amari. Amari and the Night Brothers is a good one for the sort of like 
younger fantasy school vibe. I also, people have mixed feelings about it, but I also actually really like The School for Good and Evil by Soman Chinani. Not so much the second trilogy, but I think the first trilogy is pretty good. And there is a, a movie that just came out too, so that's getting adapted. Those might be some suggestions. Beth, I have this trilogy on my Sooner pile. I bought it a while ago, but my more detailed description bumped it up. Okay, awesome. Yes, the world building is really top tier in this. I was very impressed. And it's it's different. It's different from other things I've read, which I think is cool. Ah, Kristen picked up Ninth Rain in December and is reading the final book now. Oh, I love that. I really want to keep going with them. But I just have, always have so much else to read. It's hard. Yeah, the covers are also really beautiful. Agreed. All right, let's move on to number 14, which this was another one that took me by surprise. The Helm of Midnight by Marina Lostetter. This came out in 2021. And I think the way it was pitched didn't really sound like my thing. So I didn't pick it up. And then I was reached out to by a publicist who was like, hey, do you want the second book in the series? And I was like, well, I have tell me more, maybe if you want to send me the first one. And I really liked this a lot. It's another one that's doing an interesting genre blend where it is fantasy with a serial killer murder mystery, which is, is kind of cool. And I think it does a really good job with the fantasy world building elements, but also with the, uh, the serial killer murder mystery piece of it. And uh, it's a like a queer norm society. So if that's something that you like in your fantasy, it has that. Do check content warnings if you need them, because there are some like pretty brutal murders and things. And this is an interesting one because it has multiple perspectives in different timelines that eventually you figure out how they're related. I really liked this one a lot. Um, so yeah, th this is one that took me by surprise because it's pitched as like Mistborn meets Hannibal, which I'm like, I guess I see how they get it because it does have like a, you know, full magic system and kind of in-depth world building and there is a serial killer that didn't pique my interest but i really liked it and we're following this woman who is sort of the fan their fantasy world equivalent of a detective who's investigating what she thinks might be a copycat of this infamous murderer anyway i won't say more about that because i don't want to spoil it but it's got a lot of twists and turns and i really enjoyed it and i'm looking forward to book two so yeah, this is a good one. Uh, okay. Let me, oh, okay. We got a lot of comments here. I thought of these was also thinking, oh, Nevermore. Yeah, I think Nevermore is an option. I've only read the first one, and I think those are a little more serious and less, but, but yeah, I think Nevermore could work, definitely. And yeah, some of the Rick Riordan stuff. The sequel for Helm of Midnight comes out later this year. Yes, they're supposed to be sending it to me. Oh, there's five going to be five books in the series. I didn't know. Well, I'm excited. Also, the cover doesn't necessarily speak to me. So I think this is why I didn't pick it up until they asked me about it. And then it was one of those ones that I'm like, wow, I'm really glad I said yes, because I ended up enjoying it a lot. Yay. Marina says Helm of Midnight's on your TBR this year. Love it. Um, yeah, it is pretty interesting. Beth bought Helm of Midnight as soon as you heard about it, but haven't read it yet. Fair enough. Misty was granted an ERC, but haven't been able to read it yet. I think it's it's really good. Yes, fantasy, murder, mystery, and queer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yep. Oh, shoot, what am I doing? What is happening? Ah, I was not trying to go. I was trying to scroll down on the comments, and there we go. Okay. Thought this wouldn't be for me, but you have me intrigued. Yeah, I um, that was how I felt too. And I was surprised at how much I enjoyed it. Mistborn meets Hannibal, sign me the hell up. There you go. Okay, good. Is the entire series going to be murder mysteries? That's a really good question. I am not sure. Sounds interesting. Cover is ick. <laughs> yeah, I don't love the cover, but I kind of think... I don't know. I feel like maybe the cover was to try to market it to what they thought their intended readers would be, which is maybe why I thought it wasn't for me. I don't know. That said, it's a good book. So, all right, moving on. 
number 13 is The Unbalancing by R.B. Lemberg. This is another one that was uh, really a pleasant surprise. I got this as an advanced copy from a indie press that does a few sci-fi fantasy titles every year. And I loved this so much. It was so beautiful. And I, apparently there are like short stories or novellas or something set in this universe previously published by this author. I have not read, but this is a, a another like queer fantasy by a queer non-binary author. And um, it deals a lot with gender identity and sexuality, like are fairly central to the plot, but also it's I don't know, it sounds weird or it sounds kind of weird, I guess, but it works in the book. It's set in this world where they have this bird goddess that they worship. And um, there are things going wrong. I don't want to like spoil things too. I'm like, how much can I tell you about the plot? But there are things going wrong that could sort of destroy their world. And two characters need to work together to try to figure out a solution. And um, so it's a lot about like, discovering who you are and has like this really beautiful romance as well, like in the middle of it. I wouldn't necessarily call it quite a fantasy romance, but it has a strong romantic element to it. And the way that the romance plays out is also really great with good communication and two people who are quite different from each other, figuring out how to work together. One of the characters is neurodiverse. I, it, I, I just loved it a lot. And the writing was really lovely just on a prose level. So I would recommend, um, I, I'm not sure that's a lot of information. It's hard. The plot is really unusual. The world building is cool, but it, it's just kind of hard to describe exactly what happens without spoiling anything. So hopefully that helps, but I did really love it a lot. Um, okay. Uh, Beth says, Oh, I think this is for the last book. Mine has a slightly different cover. Looks like an alien bug. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. Disa, really intrigued by this one, but not sure it's for me. I don't know if that's this one. Misty has to read this galley as well. Yeah. On Goodreads, the second book for Helm of Midnight also is categorized under mystery, so it's probably a murder mystery as well. Thank you, Mini Queen. Appreciate that. Good to know. Beth got the unbalancing from the publisher and loved it. It's a really beautiful book. Um, I should check out this book and author. So it's not self-published. I think the author maybe self-published some previous things set in the same world, but it's from a small press. So it's a traditional press. It's just not one of the big publishers and they only have a handful of titles they do every year. Yeah, the cover does look stunning with the waves. It is a beautiful book. Um, it is a lot of blue. That's fair. Anyway, it's beautiful. I really loved it. So. If that sounds up your alley, maybe give it a try. It's not very long either. It's pretty short. Next, this could have gone either way, sci-fi or fantasy. I would call this a sci fantasy, but I decided to put it here. I think the cover honestly gives more fantasy vibes than the novella actually is, but this is The Sorcerer of the Wild Deeps by Kaya Shante Wilson. I really loved this. And now that I'm thinking about it, I probably should, should have put this on my sci-fi list, but oh well, it's okay. Um, <laughs> so I think a lot of people's expectations based on the marketing going in were incorrect, and so they weren't appreciating what this book was really doing. It's not, I don't want to say a ton because it's pretty short, but it is a queer book by a gay author following a man who is probably not actually human living with humans and things happen. <laughs> I don't know how to talk about this novella. I loved it. I thought it was really smart and really interesting. It's got like quiet nuanced world building where it's very subtly woven into the story and part of the story is about the relationship between these two men um, on a journey together. But then also you're getting tidbits about the world and who the character whose head we are in really is. And we don't get a lot totally explained to us. There's a lot of subtext to it that the reader interprets. One thing that people seem not to like, but I thought was kind of a cool 
uh, stylistic device for this is that there is a difference between how the main character speaks to other characters and how he talks to himself inside his head. But I think it's kind of cool because it's like a formal version of what code switching looks like. I don't know. I thought it was a really smart book. I have like a Goodreads review that is probably more eloquent than what I'm saying here, but I loved this and I would recommend checking it out. I really need to keep going with the series because I know there's a second book as well set in the same world that is... Um, also a novella. Yes, this is it. Uh, a Taste of Honey. Exactly. It is a really interesting writing style. I liked it. I thought it was kind of cool. Some people seemed not to like that element of it, but I thought it was really smart and felt intentional. So, yeah. <laughs> and then things happen. I know. Uh, I'm sorry. I know that's not, not the most helpful. They go on a journey and they're magical things. It's one of those things that it's one of those things though that reads like fantasy but is actually sci-fi because I am pretty sure I'm again not a lot is explained, but I'm pretty sure that the intent is that it's a futuristic version of Earth and the main character is like an alien of some kind who looks human. I think that's the deal, but it reads as if it's fantasy. So hopefully that helps that there's like things that are actually science based, but because there are people who don't understand how they function, they think it's like magical, which I, I always love that. I, I'm a fan of that kind of thing. Okay, number 11 is Winter Keep by Kristen Kishor. I've been doing a read along of the Graceling series with Mel over on a book fiend called Mel's Channel. And we have live shows for all of them. We have like one last one that we're um, doing a live show for. This is uh, my favorite book in the series. And that is maybe controversial because some people didn't like it. I love it. I am have been so pleasantly surprised by the series read along in general. And so I put this here because it was my favorite, but I really want to talk about the entire series. Uh, the first trilogy was published, you know, quite some time ago, like 2009, 2010, something like that for the first book. And a lot of early to mid 2000s YA fantasy books do not hold up well at all. And I really think that those do. This one is a newer one that she came back and published a decade later. But I think that the original series is so good and in some ways was kind of ahead of the curve of what was being talked about in YA literature at the time. Anyway, go check out the live shows over on Mel's channel if you're interested, because we have had a lot of really fantastic conversations. These books are tackling big issues. You know, they're talking about things like toxic masculinity and rape culture and like, you know, feminism and like all, all kinds of things. Winter Keep Yeah, Winter Keep is, it's like, how much can I say about it? Because it's like a, a new book and like the fourth book in a series. But I, I really liked what this did with character arcs and some of the deeper thematic things that are being explored. So I won't say too much more than that, but there's, there's a lot of depth to these books that I wasn't expecting, especially from a series that began during the time that it did. So I would recommend these. I think they're, they're really good. All right. The Graceling is your favorite series of all time. Yeah, I had never read the series and was asked by Mel if I would join in. And I was like, yeah, I, like I want to try it. I hope I like it. And then it's ended up being such a great, great experience. Marina, I need to pick up Graceling as well. I'm a huge fan of the new cover designs. I am with you. I really like the new cover designs as well. Night Owl Reader has yet to read Graceling. I was in the same boat I, uh, up until fairly recently. Small channel definitely needs to pick up the series. It's a good one. Read the entire series when Bitter Blue came out and it still has a place on your shelves. Yes. Love it. Yeah. Get to Bitter Blue is great. And uh, the live show for Sea Sparrow is over on her channel, I think, February 4th. So that's coming soon. All right. Let's go to number 10. This is another series that I read in its entirety this past year, 
The Ruin of Kings by Jen Lyons. This series was really fun. I read all five books, which I'm very proud of because they are an achievement to get through, but I really like what they're doing. They're so, they're intense though. This Listen, I completely understand why this is not going to be everybody's kind of fantasy, but I really love it. It's fairly complex. Um, there are footnotes and multiple timelines, and it's set in this world where there is reincarnation and also magical body swapping. So like hereditary lines get complicated and who's who gets very complicated sometimes. So you kind of have to pay attention, but it's a really cool inventive series. There's also um, like a lot of queer characters and really interesting conversations about gender identity, especially in the second book and later books in the series. And just a lot of interesting twists and turns to the world building and characters. It's a very large cast of characters. And I will say for me, as we got farther into the series, I was like, this is a lot to keep track of. But I kind of like the payoff was mostly worth it. I, I it's one that I kind of want to go back and reread the whole series kind of back to back at some point because I feel like maybe I would do better on a reread because there there's a lot of moving pieces. I'm just impressed that Jen Lyons was able to pull off what she pulled off in the series, but it's really good. And The Ruin of Kings was a great book. I think this this might have been my favorite book in the series, which I think is not a common opinion. All right. Misty loves this series. Yes. Beth says another one on my sooner list. It sounds so good. It is. Yeah. Oh, Kelly got, got it for Christmas. Yay. Okay. So you read them back to back last year. The de best way to do it. I couldn't definitely see that, that it would be a good way to do it of just really pushing through them because it would be so easy to sort of lose the, th the thread of what's happening. Memory of Souls major top 10. I love that. I will say too, I was very satisfied with a, oh, well, I don't want to spoil anything. Anyway, there was a, there, there were a group of characters that I was very satisfied with their ending. I'll just say that at the end of the series. Might give this one a shot, at least the first one. Yeah, I think try the first one and see if you get on with it. Mm -hmm. If anyone managed to read The Silmarillion, they'll have no problem with A Chorus of Dragons. Fair enough. I have not tried The Silmarillion. <laughs> There's rumors of an upcoming series set in the same world. Really? Oh, that could be interesting. It's a cool world. I like it. Thinking I'll dedicate each year to a major fantasy series, and this is the Joe Abercrombie year. I love that idea. That's part of what has actually been kind of cool about doing um, about doing read-alongs for the podcast is we've been able to just like push through an entire series and doing read-alongs is a nice way to do that. So I'm excited to finally read the Witcher series in 2023. That's going to be good. All right. Number nine is a uh, anthology or a short story collection, I should say. This is Boys, Beasts, and Men by Sam J. Miller. And this actually came out through Tachyon Press, it's the same small press that put out um, the unbalancing that was earlier on this list. This is such a good short story collection. And it's not often that a short story collection makes my favorites list, but this one definitely did. And I put it here, but it's like a mix of science fiction and fantasy. It is very dark though, and very queer. The author is a gay man, and that is like a big piece of the stories that he's writing. But I just thought these were fantastically written. I liked every story in the collection. Some of them are rough. Like there's, um, there's one that's about the, the, the impact of the AIDS crisis in like the eighties and nineties, for instance, but as a speculative story. Anyway, 
yeah. Go check out, like, I think I have more information on Goodreads if you want to hear more details, if that sounds up your alley. But I really loved this collection. I thought it was beautifully written and just really interesting and inventive in the way that it used different speculative genres and fantasy and science fiction to talk about the different aspects of things he wanted to talk about. So worth a look if you like short stories. Yeah, it was very interesting. All right. I don't know if I've heard anybody else review this one, but they sent it to me and I really liked it. It is dark though. <laughs> like there's a lot of content warnings. All right. Number eight is another YA fantasy. This is The Sunbearer Trials by Aidan Thomas. I really loved this. This is exactly what I want from a YA fantasy, to be honest. And I also think that this is Aidan Thomas's best book yet. I've really enjoyed his other books, but this one I think really stepped it up and it's fun. It's action packed. It's got almost like a Hunger Games vibe to a certain extent, but with a trans boy main character drawing on the history and culture of Mexico and other Latin American countries. And it was like fun and touching and meaningful and just, there was just a lot that happened here. And um, I really liked it a lot. I, this was, I would say, you know, the best YA fantasy, certainly, that I read in 22. I would recommend it. And uh, Aiden Thomas is a trans Mexican author. So um, yeah, I thought this was great. Kristen, oh, cool. Uh, Boys, Beasts, and Men in the Unbalance are in our, Unbalancing are in a Humble Bundle right now in the $10 tier. I don't know what a Humble Bundle is, but that sounds great. So maybe I should Google that. That's great. So yeah, go check it out. Carrie says this is high on your TBR pile. Terry's going to read this soon. Good. Yes, I love the cover. Color, sorry, I love the cover as well. I think it's really beautiful. And I think the world building elements are, are cool. And the relationships with different people. I thought this was great. Yes, Aiden Thomas. I liked Cemetery Boys, but I just, you know, I thought there was a lot to like about it. But I think his writing has definitely improved to the Sunbearer Trials. I think you can see him growing as an author, which is cool. Very interested to own a copy of Aiden Thomas's book. Love it. Yay. Yeah, the characters and interactions are really cute. I think this is very good YA fantasy written for teenagers, you know, like this is this is kind of what I want to see out of a very well-written fantasy that is actually written for its target market, if that makes sense. I think it's good. Christopher Hay didn't like Cemetery Boys as much as everyone else did and heard not so good things about that one about the woods, but trust my opinion on fantasy. Yeah, so I, okay, I have an unpopular opinion in that I did like the, his second book, but I understand, I, I get why there were mixed reactions to it. And Cemetery Boys, I liked it, but I also, there were some craft things about it that I was like, okay, like, it's a debut, this could be better. Um, so I don't know what you didn't love as much about it. I liked the representation a lot and I liked the characters, but there were some like things about the mystery plot that I was like, mm, okay, or the pacing or whatever. So I do think in terms of that kind of craft stuff, the Sunbearer Trials is for sure a step up. So yeah. Also really like Cemetery Boys, but I do love all elements. Awesome. Yeah might check this out in his sophomore book. Yeah, I liked his sophomore book as well, which was actually his debut, technically his debut. He actually wrote that one before Cemetery Boys. It just didn't sell first, which is interesting. So I think people weren't expecting it because they were expecting the second book to also feature a trans character, and it didn't because it was written before. Anyway, but Didn't love all elements of Cemetery Boys. Yeah, fair enough. Same. I mean, same. But um, yeah. 
All right. Number seven is another novella. Uh, this is Spear by Nicola Griffith. I really loved this. This is a um, a queer Arthurian retelling, and it's it's great. It's um, following a queer woman who dresses as a man in order because she her goal is she wants to become one of Arthur's knights and um it is a it's a retelling of a specific story it is escaping me which thing it is if anybody in the comments knows what it is feel free to let me know um I am less familiar with all of the original Arthurian mythology than some people are but I loved this I thought the writing itself was really lovely it's really poetic and I, I just thought it was a very very good no novella so if that sounds up your alley i think it's good christopher hated the pacing so much but loved the representation and had mixed feelings yeah i i get that so i think you might do better with sunbearer trials maybe try it yes it's a great cover kristen says spear was a pleasant surprise for me yeah same. I didn't I, I didn't expect a whole lot out of it, but I just really loved it. It is cool. Beth wants to read this one again, but have heard mixed reviews. Interested again if it's high on your list. Yeah, some people didn't like it, I guess. I don't know why. <laughs> I'll have to go look at their reviews to see. I didn't have any complaints about it. I thought it was great. So I don't know. Uh, have a hard time with King Arthur retellings as well as Alice in Wonderland, but would give this a try. Yeah, I am with you, to be honest. However, I think part of what worked for me about this is that Arthur is on the periphery of the story. And because it's a novella, like it's pretty tightly focused on the main character and her kind of journey and experience. And Arthur does eventually show up in the story, but it's not the main focus. So if that helps, I don't know. I thought it was, it did some interesting things. I've seen mixed reviews. Well, thank you that you trust my opinions. I mean, I... Obviously, you know, people's mileage is going to vary. People like different things. It worked for me. Um, you know, I'm sure there are people who might not like it. DNF'd it. The writing was flowery to the point where I couldn't follow the plot. That's fair. It is very flowery, poetic writing. I love that kind of thing. But if you don't like it, that would be a reason to not pick this up. So I think that is very reasonable. I thought the writing was beautiful. But... Um, I think it just depends on your preference in terms of writing style. So, yeah. Night Owl Reader is very interested. Awesome. All right. Number six is one of two 2023 releases on this list because <laughs> um, I read them in 2022. This just came out on Tuesday. The Keeper Six by Kate Elliott. I freaking love this. I read this at the end of the year and it was so good. This is. Um, and, oh, and, and I had the chance to interview Kate Elliott recently for the channel. So if you haven't seen that, go check it out. I've, it was such a good interview. And I don't know how many people are watching it because she's uh, like a less well-known author than I think she deserves to be. She's really amazing, has been writing for decades and writes great sci-fi fantasy and is really into history. And anyway, I love her. But it was really fun to talk and hear more about this, but it's a novella that begins in our world in Hawaii, but then has a portal fantasy element to it. And it is following a older woman protagonist who is a mother of adult children and a grandmother to babies. And uh, she is going through a portal to get her son back because her adult son has been kidnapped for reasons, and she is going to find a way, come hell or high water, to get him back. So if you like uh, badass mom, older women characters, this is fantastic. 
also what I love about this is that even though it's a novella, she packs so much into it. There's a ton of like world building and plot and character development, which I am a huge fan of. I think some people don't like that, like don't like that there's so much in a short form. But personally, I think this is a really great option if you're somebody who wants to get into more intense fantasy, like high fantasy with deep world building and stuff like that, but you want something that's bite-sized. I think this will give you that and deliver it in a complete package story that's like 200 pages long. And it's clear that the world ha could like she could write many, many more books about the world and side characters and other things, but this story is just focused on like a particular set of events. So I loved it. I thought it was wonderful. <laughs> One of my favorite things that I read, I love a, a badass mom character. I love seeing older women characters in fantasy. That is something that really works for me. And I thought the themes were really interesting. Also, the main character is Jewish, and that's like woven into the story as well, which I think is kind of cool. And um, Kate Elliott is also Jewish. So yeah, I loved this. I would recommend. More people should go read Kate Elliott. She's great. So, all right. Good to know. Don't like overly flowery prose. Yeah. So Spear, if you don't like flowery prose, Spear might not be for you, which is fine. This is one, what, the, the way, the key, sorry, I'm, I'm not understanding the beginning of this, but uh, it's saying, you're saying you bought the Keeper 6 after I talked about it. That's exciting. I'm happy to hear that. I hope you enjoy it. I think it's great. Afraid to watch it because you haven't read any of her books. I think you can watch it. Um, it's one of those ones where if you've read this book or The Servant Mage or um, her, oh, why now the, um, Unconquerable Sun. Those are the three books that I think we talk. she talks a little more in depth about. You can watch it if you haven't read them. I just think it's like if you have read them, you'll get more out of it maybe, but you, you could watch the interview. I think it's good. Oh, thank you so much. Says, I look up to your fantasy recommendations when I purchase books I want to own in my shelves. I really appreciate that. I, I hope I help people with figuring out what will work for them. <laughs> it took me several times looking at the cover before I noticed the two tiny, tiny people at the bottom right. That's a heck of a dragon. Yes. Yes. There are some little people there. It is, um, and this cover is great, actually, because I know exactly what it depicts from the book. There's like a, some scenes in the book that I know what it's depicting. It's really cool. I, I think it's great. Oh, you forgot it's a novella because of how it's talked about. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, technically it's like a short novel, I guess. But it, yeah, it's only 200 pages, but there's a lot that happens. It's great. Marina needs to request it from your library. Yes, do it. It's so good. Yay. Putting Kate Elliott and Keeper 6 on your list. Wonderful. Meant Kate. Oh, the Kate Elliott book is on its way to you, Shipping Diceland. Okay, cool. Sorry, I was confused about what this... Oh, because it's one and stuff. Okay, I, I see. I see. Oh, thank you so much. Mia says, you along with a few other booktubers helped me decide on what to read for genres I haven't picked, figured out what I like in. That's, that's great. That's what I hope to do. I hope to be able to provide reviews that will, regardless of what my taste is, you know, because we can like different things. Like, I hope that my reviews will help you, guide you to books that will be to your taste. Um, even if they're not the same as what I love. All right. Oh, we're getting there. Top six. Wow. And actually, I think this is, yes. So this number six, the top six are books that got six stars, which is what I give to a favorite of the year. So this is the first book on the list that is on my overall favorites for the year list. There's a lot of really good fantasy this year. All right. Okay, number five is the other 2023 release, and this is actually a middle grade graphic novel that is coming out in March. This is The Moth Keeper by Kay O'Neill. I loved this so much. It was so beautiful. The art is gorgeous. If you might know Kay O'Neill from the Tea Dragon Society, they've written a few different really lovely middle grade fantasy graphic novel things. Um, but this follows a girl who is 
the apprentice moth keeper for her village and she is about to start taking over responsibilities for keeping these lunar moths, but it's a job that is very lonely. And um, so it's a book that is dealing with burnout and loneliness, but in a way that is age appropriate for middle grade audience. And it's about the importance of family and community. It's also, she always writes queer norm societies as well that are kind of in the background. It's just really lovely and beautiful and made me tear up. So highly recommend checking this one out. It again is coming out in March and it's lovely. It is adorable. The cover is really adorable. Yeah, I love the cover. The artwork is really beautiful. They do all of their own art for the books too, which I think is great. Tara wants to read it. Yes, it's so cute. It's so good. Nixon of Fiction is looking forward to the Marth Moth Keeper. Yay. Um, makes you think of the covers for Little Prince and Witch Hat Atelier. Yeah, I can see that. It's got kind of a similar a vibe to it. Hi, Beth. So excited for this release. Adored the Chi Dragon books. Yeah, this one was so good. Um, I think it's, uh, this to me reads like their kind of pandemic book in some ways, but in a good way. Like, I, I think this is dealing with like burnout and isolation, which I think for a lot of kids, that was their lived reality during that time. Anyway, I love this a lot. It's so good. So good. Read all of their other books and really enjoyed them. This looks cute as well. It is very cute. Yay! I'm glad people are excited for it. I'll have to get a cover or get a copy for myself when it comes out. I had an early digital review copy, which was cool. I read it very early, which I don't usually do, but I was like, I need a win right now, and it delivered. <laughs> so it's really good. All right. Number four is the other Joe Abercrombie. This is The Wisdom of Crowds, which is the final book in the First Law series. Um, the overall one, this is the, the third book in the second trilogy. It's, uh, man, for me at least, I thought this was perfectly executed. Like, so good. <laughs> it's it's the end of a whole series so there's not that much I can say about it but I just thought that this was exactly the ending that it should be for the project that it was that is really vague but I just I thought this was beautifully done and it also took me by surprise because I think I expected something and it did something similar but I don't know I can't this I can't talk about it it's too far into the series so if you've read them and you want to hear go check out the chapter three podcast episode for it and for the other books in the series because oh there's so much it's so good I know Liana is like the biggest Abercrombie fangirl but she wasn't wrong like this book it's so good <laughs> it's amazing I loved it okay Uh, okay. Let's see. Loved the Tea Dragon Society. Yes, that cover is adorable. Must try Joe Abercrombie. Where is best to begin with him? I think, um, I think the blade itself is a great place to start as long as you go in knowing that it is going to be slow. Like, I think the blade itself has amazing character work. On a first read, though, it feels like the plot is going nowhere, but it's also one of those books where, like, it's still good. Like, the first, okay, so I think the first time I read it, I gave it four stars. Like, I liked it, and I liked what it was doing, and I thought it was interesting, and I thought the characters were fantastic, especially some of them that were favorites especially, but I felt like this was so slow. Where is this going? I don't have a good sense of it. When I went back and reread it, having finished that original trilogy, it was a completely different experience where I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. It's like got little Easter eggs that are pointing to things that are happening later on and foreshadowing stuff that I never would have noticed the first time around, which is cool for a reread, but like not ideal for a first one. So I do think that you can tell by um, the beginning of this second trilogy, A Little Hatred, which was written like many years after that first trilogy, that he's definitely leveled up as an author and does a better job of like keeping you engaged, even if you've not read any of the other books 
from the get-go, um, but the character work is always fantastic. So I think the blade itself is a really good place to start if you're okay with it being a bit slow at the beginning. Uh, the payoff at the end of that trilogy is well worth it. If you uh, just can't deal with that, there are a couple other places you could start, um, but that's probably probably the best option. I can I I'm I'm not I'll, I could talk too much about this but again like Liana I think also has an entire video about where to start so I would maybe direct you to her channel because she's she's got an entire video just about that which is great. My face was immediately like this when I saw the cover of the previous book I love it. You see the way you love and describe Joe's books while I love that you love them I know are definitely not for me. <laughs> totally fair. That's uh, totally fair. His books are not going to be for everyone. Um, I love them, but that's that's fair. Yeah, the blade itself is probably the best place to start, but there are other places you could start, depending on the kind of reader you are. The chaos in this book is done really well, but it was also not my favorite. Uh, that's fair. That's fair. Um, yeah, there's a lot happening. Yeah, I think publication order is ideal, but I don't think you have to do it that way. It would just be a really different experience to read it a different way. Library has select Joe books and I'd have to save money to buy him. Yeah, that's fair. Um, yeah. Yes, Abercrombie has been very coy about whether he'll write more. He's supposedly working on a different book that he's struggling to get through. So I'm like, when are we going to get another book? I don't know. We'll see. Then I start with Blade itself. Good. Great. I didn't think the plot was going nowhere. I just thought it was so fun. Always had in mind at one point all the different plot points will connect somehow. That's great. I thought it dragged a little bit, but I think other people have had your experience. Um, and I think it just depends on you know what works for you. Beth, I didn't feel like the Blade itself had too little plot. It felt like small actions weren't much advancing the overall plot arc, but there was enough going on. It kept your interest. That's, yeah. I mean, there are things happening. I think part of the thing for me is that there were only a couple of characters that I really loved in The Blade itself. And so some of the other, some of the perspectives I was kind of bored by on my first reading. And so that was a little bit of a struggle for me. So kind of like putting together a puzzle. The first book puts together the edge pieces. Yes, I think that is accurate. Definitely accurate. Okay. <sighs> Number three. <laughs> I love this book so much. Um, Legends and Lattes by Travis Baldry. I, listen, when I first read this, I was like five stars, but a high five. And then it's just stuck with me. And I was like, this is, this is no, this is high on my list of best books I've read this year. Also a book where if you need a lot of plot, this will not be the book for you. <laughs> it is like, it. it is exactly what it tells you it is. It's high fantasy, very low stakes. It is super duper cozy slice of life. It is about a retired ogre, barbarian ogre who is opening a coffee shop. And like, that is, that is pretty much what the book is about. And I loved it. There is sort of a sapphic romance, but like barely, it's like a very low key thread. I just loved it. It was beautiful and cozy and happy and exactly what I wanted. Um, there are people who are not fans of this book because they're like, there's no plot. They're not wrong. There's not much plot. <laughs> I'm okay with that. I enjoyed it. It was one of my favorite things that I read, and I am so excited for the rise of cozy fantasies. I want more of them. Please give them all to me. But again, you just need to know yourself because I understand why people don't. Like, Liana hated this. She doesn't usually like cozy, and she wants more plot, which is fine. But oh my god, this was just, oh, it was so cute, and I loved it so much, and like all the little coffee shop things and the baker, oh, it was great, it was great. We did it for Patreon Book Club, it was fun. Um, Marina, I read almost all my books, I read almost all my books from the library or other audio before I buy them, that way I only buy what I actually love and one on my shelves. That's, yeah, I mean, I think that's a great way to go. Love Legends and Lattes, so cozy, it is. 
Beth says, I love this book. I would adopt Thimble. Same. I love Thimble so much. Ah, oh, I just, oh, listen, it's so good. I guess it was because I don't know who to root for at all. So I was just gung-ho for taking some time to learn about all the different characters. I think this is for the Abercrombie book. That makes sense. Yes, Travis Baldry is writing another book. There is another one in this world coming, I think, sometime this year, which is exciting. Yeah, it's, uh, people say this is like Stardew Valley in a book. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's probably not wrong. Loved Legends and Latte is high fantasy slice of life. Yes, yes, exactly. I think it's great. Legends and Lattes was in my top 10 of the year and favorite fantasy. So cozy and loved all the characters. Yay. I'm so glad. I love it. I want to buy the cool. Oh, the water. Oh, yes. This. Okay. So this is, by the way, this is actually just the general UK. Har I did get it from Waterstones, but this is just the UK hardcover. So, um, but yeah, it is really cool. And then it's got the, the cover art underneath. It's, it's neat. Um, okay, this is a good question. So it's, uh, hold on a second. Sapphic, S-A-P-P-H-I-C, Sapphic Romance. So it's um, basically bet romance between women um, related to, it's, it's drawn from Sapphos, who was a woman Po like a poet, like an ancient poet who wrote about love of women. And the reason a lot of people will use sapphic instead of just like lesbian is it's more inclusive of a term. So sapphic can include a romance between two bisexual women who might not necessarily be lesbian. So hope that is helpful. Okay, where I lost, I lost my place. Here we go. When I read Legends and Lattes, I went into it thinking no stakes. So I actually kind of thought the conflict was too much, but I still loved it. Okay. So there, yeah, there's some stakes. So that's fair. The vibes of the book are impeccable. I did wish there was more romance. I would have taken more romance. Yep. Sometimes I feel traumatized with books with a lot of sadness and just need a warm, cozy book where nothing too tragic happens. I am 100% with you. And that was what I needed when I read this book. And it, it was great. Usually like things to be dark and intense, but sometimes you need a breather. Yeah. Tara loved the book. Yes, the cover art is really cute. No problem. I hope that helps. Thank you for typing this out. Sapphic. Yes. You know what? And actually before I was familiar with booktube, I didn't know this term either. So yeah. Yeah, I could have used a little more romance. I still love it for what it is, but yeah. Fair enough. All right. Number two was The Sword of Kaigen by Emma Wang. I just loved this. It was so good. I um, I don't know. I had heard a lot of people talking about it, and I didn't think it would be my thing. I don't know why exactly. I think I had envisioned more kind of high action martial arts type thing, which is not really what this is. It is deeply character driven. The main character is um, a mother who is kind of a badass. And the character work in this book is so good. I loved it. It made me cry. Um, I ended up reading this in a vlog I did where I read books that I purchased because of Angela at Literature Science Alliance. And it was her review that finally got me to buy a copy of it because I'd heard people talking about it. And I was like, I don't know, it doesn't really sound like my thing. And then her review, I was like, okay, maybe it would be my thing. And it was just so good. I really, really loved it. And I also supported the Kickstarter for the fancy <laughs> special edition version because I'm like, yes, I would like a special edition of this book. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I, I loved this a lot. It is kind of heartbreaking at times and it is intense, but I would for sure recommend checking it out if that sounds like your thing. Uh, okay. Ah, oh, sorry. Whoops. The comments keep moving around. Here we go. Actually, Googled the term sapphic when you first came across it. That was probably a good idea. Night Owl Reader has mixed feelings about Sword of Kaigen. It's fine. 
really need to read Sword of Kaigen. I read it. Yes, I read it earlier in the year. I loved it. Oh, Sword of Kaigen was your favorite of 2021. I love that. It's great. Have this, but haven't read it yet. She also has another book coming out this year. Yeah, I hear it's set in the same world, which I'm excited for. I would love to read more in this world because it's very interesting. One thing that I also I think is good to know going into this is it is fantasy, but it's it's actually kind of like modern. They live on an island <laughs> that still holds to older traditions, but the rest of the world is pretty modern. So. I, which which I think isn't necessarily what everybody would expect. Also read this in 2021 through Shelf Space. Awesome. Thought the pacing was slow in places. It might be. I think in this case I didn't care because I was so invested in everything that was happening that I just ate it up, could not stop reading it. Got this one on Audible because of Laura from a book circus and I haven't read it yet. <laughs> <laughs> I understand having a large TBR. That's hard. Disa has heard a lot of good things about sort of Kaigen. Um, oh, yeah. Read some very hard-hitting books last year, and Legend and Lattes was exactly what you needed then. Yeah, it would do that. Yes, this was a book where you needed a breather after it. Yeah, it's it, check content warnings if you need them, because there is some intense content, but I loved it. Yes, loved how this followed a mom. Also, it broke me. Yeah, <laughs> pretty, pretty much, but it was so good. <laughs> yeah. Heard about the Sword of Kaigen Kickstarter two days before it ended. Oh, wow. Before I started reading it, so I quickly binged the first half to make sure you liked it and then backed it. I love it. That's great. All right, moving on. <sighs> Number one, my favorite fantasy of the year is, like, this is probably an unpopular opinion, and some of you who've seen me rave about this are not going to be surprised. Some people didn't like this. I love it. It it was everything. Siren Queen by Nevo. Oh my gosh, this book is so good. I will say this book is, like, all the vibes and the themes, and, um, you know, that's not going to be everybody's deal, which is fine. But this was perfection for me. It is set in an alternate version of golden era Hollywood, following a young Chinese American woman who dreams of being an actress and uh, her journey into the world of the silver screen. However, this is a book that is literalizing the predatory practices of Hollywood studios and producers of the time, especially towards young women and even more so young women of color. And it's literalizing it using fey mythology. <laughs> and um, I loved it. This is also a sapphic book. She's a lesbian. She has intimate relationships with a couple of different women through the course of the book. And she is a badass. She is morally gray and is willing to do whatever it takes to get what she wants out of life. And I just was living for all of it. So I loved this book a lot. And I understand why it is not going to be everybody's thing, but I, I mean, I can love it enough for everybody else. It's okay. <laughs> I think it's amazing. It is a stunning cover. Yes. Uh, Marina read her Singing Hills book this year and her writing, yes, her writing is beautiful. I will read anything she writes at this point, but this is definitely like top tier for me. Mooney Queen loves vibes. If you love vibes, this is lots of vibes. It is a beautiful cover. I've heard mixed things about this, but I remember you talking about it in the live show and you actually made me want to pick it up. Yes, like success. I know there are mixed opinions on it, but oh, it's so good. I knew this one had to be somewhere on the list. Another one you made me want to read. I love that I'm I'm like the one championing the books that other people don't love as much. Yay, reading Siren Queen now after picking it up during the Barnes and Noble sale. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah, I love this a lot. Need to read this Loved Foe Singing Hill series. Yeah. Yes. Hey, Kristen. Siren Queen was in your top 10. Nevo is all about vibes. Yeah. She is all about vibes. It's great. 
Would you recommend this to someone even if they aren't necessarily interested in old Hollywood? Yeah, I mean, I think I think especially if you find the specific themes that she's exploring interesting, which is is really about the way they were predatory towards young women um and about and like the kind of story of like a woman mm, like taking what she wants from life and having her own sense of identity in the midst of that um regardless of the pressures around her if that sounds appealing to you with lots of like fey unexplained darkly magical vibes <laughs> then yes <laughs> um so yeah Makes me think of Evelyn Hugo when you said badass that's willing to do anything to get what she wants in life. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can see the connection. Although the difference is that this lady is going to bow to no man. She is going to demand what she wants and find a way to get it, even if he doesn't want to give it to her, which I love and respect. So Tara says definitely going to get to this one this year. Yay. Yeah. Beth says, I do love vibes. I mean, it's a lot of vibes. <laughs> so, like, I don't think Liana would like this because the magic system is not explained enough and it's too much vibes for her, probably, but I loved it a lot. And that is it. Those are my top 20 fantasy books that I read in 2022. It was a really good year for fantasy. There were so many great books. And uh, hopefully this was interesting for everybody. Thanks for hanging out with me and for all of your questions and comments. I hope this helped you find some new things to add to your TBRs and, and things to check out. And I will be back with, um, I think, the last list is going to be my full, like, top books of the year and then um everything else is going to be like oh well i guess i have like my dnfs and my stats and stuff so like those videos will be to come but i'll be back for that and um yeah hopefully this was fun do not let liana read siren queen <laughs> no <laughs> she'll tear it apart i don't want to do that thanks everybody have a great rest of your week and i'll see you next time bye